Hi, this is Molly Cheshire, and this is Meetings with Remarkable People. My guest is Norman Curlin, and he has a revolutionary approach to economics called binary economics. And uh, it really sounds like we have a way of, of really creating something new and more equitable in, in the world. So maybe explain a little bit what exactly is binary, because it sounds kind yeah, of... Yeah, well, in, in a nutshell, binary is it divides up all the things that go into the production of marketable goods and services. Uh, it, on the one hand, there are people, and the other hand, you have capital, but, but uh, the, the way we define capital is anything, non-human thing that's capable of, of uh, t uh, together with people, for producing marketable goods and services. But what's really revolutionary, I think, is, is the, uh, how, do you, how do you call it when you take uh, capital ownership and you spread it amongst more people? Yeah, well, we, we call that capital homesteading. Uh, just as back in Lincoln's time, they had the Homestead Act for land. We we're saying that we want to look at all of your institutions, your tax institution, your central banking institution, your labor laws, welfare laws, etc., and begin to say, how can we lower the barriers or how can we create a level playing field so that in the future, every citizen, every man, woman, and child could begin to accumulate without having to take away from anybody and without having to use the tax system to redistribute the income of those who, who now own. In other words, it's, it's the classic, it's what the founders were talking about to develop ultimately a classless society, an economically classless society, or you can say to develop economic democracy which is a foundation, an essential foundation through, for through political. broadening the base of private ownership. Uh, private property. The, the institution of private property is what connects people to the rights and powers and, and fruits of whatever you own, whether it's your body or whether it is things, whether it's land or technology. Yeah, it's it, yeah. Because technology, I think uh, there's some people that say that uh, ownership of land. I mean, Paul, isn't it the Henry George people that say that uh, land? If everybody has sort of forty acres and a mule, then we'll all be happy. And and to me, you know, I know so many people that yeah. as we call it, land poor. Yeah. In that in that it used to be that was the case back yeah. in the nineteenth yeah. century, but yeah. but now you know. Land is almost a liability. Right. Well, you, you know, in the beginning, you're starting out with, with, with land. It was agricultural, agrarian uh, economy. Civilization for tens of thousands of years were basically with, with very primitive tools. So, so, right. so what happened, you know, about the time of the American Revolution was the beginning. The steam engine came into being. And, and there's an evolutionary process where the tools began to become more and more important. It's a... You know, it differs from the land frontier and the natural resource frontier because they're finite in they, they exist but as Buckminster Fuller said you can take from the land creative people designers inventors take from the land take the resources and design tools and structures so that you're always doing more and more with less and less so that the evolution that's taking place is not taking place in human beings we're not very much different than the people uh, a millennia ago, but our tools are, are much radically different. Well, and, and also, like, um, for example, there was a certain democratization when cellular came in, and, and Paula was able to capitalize on that because they had a lottery, and they allegedly opened it up, and they were trying to get away from the monopolies. I right. mean, I know that you're very against monopoly, right. And, and, and why don't you tell us why is monopoly such a bad thing? Well, a monopoly means that some people get in. Uh, the only monopoly that I think is legitimate is, is the state, is government itself, because it's a monopoly over the instruments of force or violence, so that it is the one instrument where you can use coercion to compel people. And it's just a monopoly. I mean, I'm not the convinced on this. I, I'm not that. convinced on this one. But but but, 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 but I mean, in general, why do you well, disagree because, with monopolies? Because 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 what you've done is is that power monopoly means control. If you have concentrated control, that means that others are excluded from participation in control. And if you do that, even if you have a political democracy, you'll have an economic plutocracy, and that's an unstable mix. I'll, I'll give you some, some numbers to show you okay. what's happened 
uh, from the time that America was 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 developed and and as we moved into the industrial era and then in recent years where you're adding several trillion dollars in new capital formation each year in terms of new plant and equipment, new technologies, new rentable space. If you look at the average household, it's about $40,000 of income. And if you say, okay, what does that amount to $40,000 of income? If you took a, a, a pile of $100 bills and stacked them up, it would be about a little over one and a half inches high. <laughs> now, and then you look, and this represents 50% of the, of, of the population. That is, that's the median income. And then you go to 100,000, which represents about 95% of all families. And there, it's about four inches, okay, about that, that high. And then you 95% of all families? Yeah, it, it, families are, are, are that, that, that it's the top it's the top five percent. The others, are, it's what I what I should have said. I was about that, to say, that, boy. That less than a hundred. Uh, that 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 would be less than a hundred thousand dollars. Would be ninety five percent of your population. Okay. Okay. And then and then you go to a million, and there you got about one third to one percent, and there you got a little over a yard high in in stacks of hundred dollar bills. Then you go to a one billion, you know, and there are about 300 billionaires in the United States. And that's about, uh, it's over a half a mile. It's about a kilometer high. And then you go to last year, there was a hedge fund operator who earned $3.7 billion in hedge fund profits. Who is that, by the way? John Paulson, that was his okay. name. And there were about three, uh, two others. Uh, George Soros earned, uh, earned a lot in, in hedge fund uh, money. And if you look at 3.7 billion dollars in a year, that's so uh, that's about uh, three uh, about 2.3 miles high, okay. And then if you go to a 10 billion dollar, there are 10 billion uh, there are people who 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 earn that that much. Uh, you're you're talking now about something about uh, uh, the size of. Um, uh, the, uh, Mount Everest, okay? And then if you talk, uh, and then if you look, this is 10 billion. And then 50 billion, uh, uh, Bill Gates in one year increased his net assets by $50 billion. Assets or income? Uh, his assets, his assets. Well, okay. it, well you had capital gains, okay. uh, so, so that it was, it was an income. And, and, and that, that's roughly 31 miles high of, of, of $1 bills. Now you compare that to the world, where a very high percentage of the of the world's population live on one dollar a day, or or two dollars a day, right. and you begin to say, you know, what causes all of that? Well, uh, uh, Lewis Kelso, my mentor, uh, one of my uh, one of my mentors, uh, the father book, of binary economics. The economic. father of binary economics said, look, the reason that happens is not in human nature so much as it is in our institutions. And we design our institutions, our laws. And if our laws create barriers to participation, then in a good society which respects the dignity of everyone, that wants to be a just society because if you don't have justice, you're not gonna have peace in the world. But if you believe, if you, if you want peace, then you must have justice. And in that book by, by, that he and Mortimer Adler wrote, uh, the Capitalist Manifesto, which which I think is is a beautiful book, and the second book shows you how you can change the world. The, the new Except capitalist. I, I would probably change the title because you're right. I think that it's too easy to confuse it with the Communist Manifesto because of the binary aspect of broadening the you're base right. of ownership. You're right. And the Communists said that private ownership was bad, but they still wanted to broaden the base. Okay, this is an interesting point, Molly, because Milton Friedman. Uh, uh, in Time magazine said that Kelso turns Karl Marx upside down on his head. Why? Because if you read the Communist Manifesto, Marx says you can summarize the entire philosophy of communism in a single sentence. You know what that is? Abolish Dude, what? Abolish private some, ownership. There you go. Private property. And, and in the Communist Manifesto, there were 10 points on how you abolish private property, and most of the countries of the world have already adopted the 10 points. Now that's interesting. And they're not all communists. And they're not all communists, okay? 
the progressive income tax, graduated income tax, right. okay? There are various other things that Karl Marx said. Which, of course, is illegal, but that's another story. Okay, but so Kelso said, no, he agreed with Marx that a, uh, a monopoly capitalist system would, would be inherently unstable. You can't, and the reason for that is if the workers, he, he understood that if you're going to produce, you've got to have consumption power. You're, you're producing for human consumption. That's the reason that, that people go into production. And he said that, that if, uh, Marx said, if the workers have only their labor to sell in a market system, in a free market system, they would be competing against technology right. that would, that would uh, eliminate hence, their, their, the need for their labor. Hence the Luddites. Uh, exactly. And uh, exactly, it's the Luddites. Or... Who destroyed all their machines. Or, just or workers... Or or workers in other countries who are, uh, who who will take less pay right. for the same work, a la what's happening now in terms outsourcing. Of, except when you try to get people to do these jobs, nobody there wants. There you them. go. There you go. In the meantime, you have rising unemployment in America and rising instability. There's going to be an explosion, the, simply because our our policies have not recognized the barriers to participation and ownership. It's that simple, and the barriers. Were, were not created by, by God. They were created by human beings and therefore can be recreated. Various right. can, be, can be pulled down. So that if you combine the ideas of, of Fuller and Kelso and another one of our founders was Father William Faree, who, who wrote on social justice and the principles of social justice, and then Martin Luther King and how you act. What, what are the principles of social justice? Oh, the principles of social justice is that you can't change the world by yourself. That there's a whole there's a whole expansion of moral philosophy from how we relate to one another in as individuals to how we as individuals relate to our institutions and our obligations and responsibilities to our institutions and to the extent they're what if unjust, they're unjust exactly when they're unjust That's then it's... then you must know that you can't change them by yourself I see yeah and so civil disobedience can't be an individual thing. Well, I, well, it's, you don't even have to engage in civil disobedience if you do it right. I what see. you do is is you develop new leaders who are inspired by justice, you see, mm -hmm. and they teach. They organize many, many people, so you get people power. And if you mobilize enough people power, right. you'll be able to do what other people say is impossible. Okay, so here's the impossible thing that I want to address. I, I, the people that are the billionaires and soon to be trillionaires, right, right. they're not going to want to give up their control, economic sure. pa freedom, so or so they think, you know, which right. we know is an right. illusion. Right. But um, how do you convince them that binary is in their best interest? Oh, well, that's that's a good question. Stokely Carmichael, who was you know brought in the idea of black power back in the back in the '60s, mm -hmm. and we were friends because I had been working in Mississippi with the with uh, the Freedom Summer, Mississippi Freedom Summer, and SNCC, and Medgar Evers. These were yes. friends of mine, and I but worked you knew there. Maker. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, I, well, yeah. We'll talk about it another time. Oh, yeah. We, oh, we'll yeah. do a few I'll shows. I'll show you a letter from him to wow. us. Wow. Just a few months before he died. He died? Visited. He was shot? I know. He got killed. And well, then anyway, I mean, you make it sound like he sort of passed away. Well, no, 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 no. I know he was shot. No, I, wrote I, mean, a, I wrote a piece for... I'm sure you do. Let, let me tell you, I wrote a piece for SNCC. It was called... A, a, an anatomy of a, a, a of a martyrdom, and it was on what led up to his being shot in, right. the, in the back. Now we're very we were friends. No, I'm sure you knew he was shot. It's just funny because oh, yeah. people who don't know yeah. who he is, maybe yeah, they don't know who you know. But, but they don't know the best. Well, the ghost of Mississippi did. I thought did a pretty yeah. good job with it. I mean, yeah. did you see that movie? No, no. Anyway, we'll talk about it another time. Yeah. But so uh, let's back back to how do you convince. The uh, billionaires. Okay, the, that's the a good question. Is it's, the... it's simple. What I said to Stokely when, and I, he's a Marxist, and so I went over the Kelso ideas, and he understood, and he said, Norm, they will never buy it, and that's the question that you're posing, and I said, Stokely, no revolutionary should ever make that statement, because you're trying to appeal to 99 percent plus of humanity. You're talking not black power, but people power, mm -hmm. correct? He said, yeah. And I said, power follows property. It always okay. has, it always will, because what? And whether that's land or intellectual doesn't make property. It, exactly, exactly. Anything that's convertible to exactly. cash. Exactly. And I said, I said, Stokely, 
there is no monolithic they. Right. And so what you want to do if you're a true revolutionary is you want to find those who are they's who agree with you. And, and, and uh, for example, George and Charlie Pillsbury from the Pillsbury mm -hmm. family became, became our, our advocates, and that's how we got employee stock owner Kelso and I Oh. We're able to get employee stock ownership plans into the Congress. And the, and, the, and the stock ownership plans are the way, see, the way that Robert Ashford explained it to me was that basically what uh, binary economics is so effective with is, is it takes leverage buyout, which sounds like a bad idea, right, because it's, only, it's been yeah, abused, right, 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 right. but that it originally was uh, created on behalf of the workers so that they could get access to credit systems it. that... Uh, it's the key. That's wait, wait, but let me just finish it for the <laughs> audience because they might not quite understand this. Um, commercial lending yeah. is available to people with capital because they have the assets, whereas with leverage buyouts, you can use the future earnings yeah. of a company to, to borrow against. Well, and, then, and then it would come back to the workers. Well, what happened is they got hijacked from the people in power and they figured that was this, this was a great trick. So. Yeah, well, this is the second book by Kelsey. The first one was highly philosophical. This one gave the gave the answer. the The subtitle of this book is a proposal to free economic growth from the slavery of mm -hmm. savings. Mm -hmm. Now, what he meant by that was past savings. And what binary economics does is provide you the credit that can be paid with future savings, right. future profits. Right. And so first you as the owner will be denied those profits while you're paying back the loan. Right. And then after that, the fruits of capital, dividends, are yours as a supplement to wages, to lift you out of wage slavery right. into, into a more just economic system. I mean, and this isn't a passive thing. It's not like you sort of sit back. You, you still have to do the work. Um, oh, yeah. But it, it's a more equitable arrangement. But, but work, you see, Kelso and Adler talked about work the way Aristotle did. He said there are two kinds of work. There's economic work, which you do for pay. Right. And then there's another kind of work, and that's unlimited, but you don't do it for pay. You do it for satisfaction, for pleasure. He right. called it leisure work. Leisure work. It's the work right. of civilization, producing the, 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 the music, the philosophy, the teaching. People still get teaching. paid for music. No, but they don't have to be. A, a, a real a, a real artist produces because he loves to create. Well, this was a huge argument my parents had for about a, you know a month over the dinner table about my mother was convinced people worked because they loved what they were doing and then they got paid for it because they loved it and my father was convinced that people only worked for money and that uh, whether they love to do it or not. And, and I can give you, cite you chapter and verse, because I know- I think he's arguing. right. I think in general, I mean, they're both in general. Right. No, but see, the people I think that really succeed love what they're doing. Okay, I love, I love my work, okay? I would do what I would want to do, and I think every revolutionary doesn't do it for money. I consider myself, that, that my profession is not a lawyer. I, I consider right. the is most noble, the most noble profession is to be a revolutionary, but a let, revolutionary of ideas. But so back to the question of how is it that you transfer the wealth from the billionaires? Okay, no, you don't transfer it from the no, no, no. Okay, no transfer. So whatsoever. how do you convince the billionaires oh. that this is a good? Thing? Okay, be, okay, that's 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 what I finally said to to to. Now here's, you separate the haves into those who agree with the philosophy, and it makes sense because. The, the one thing that they will say is, don't take it from me. Right. See, as a matter of fact, John D. Rockefeller III wrote a book. Uh, it's called The Second American Revolution, in which he, he applauded Kelso because he said, this is a way in which have-nots could become haves without taking from right. the haves. That's the key. And so, and so th but there still will be, and your question is a good one, because there will be those who say, look, it's, a, it's an exclusive club and I love it. I want it to remain exclusive. Okay? Right. Okay? And those people, they cannot oppose it openly. And the reason they can't oppose it openly, I'm not saying that there aren't many other ways to oppose it. Right. They can try shooting people like me. Well. Okay? I mean, that's... Yeah, the a, that's ideas a, are difficult to, to That's kill. exactly. Exactly. They, they are difficult. But, but here's the thing. Their power... The power that they enjoy rests with the institution of private property. And if they say private property is mm. good for me, but not for you, 
you can't get away well with it's it. not that it's that they say private property is good for me uh, but I don't want to give you any money to you don't uh, have to right that's why that's why this book is so important because it shows that you can create money out of thin air just as they're now the Federal right. Reserve through leveraged is, well more than that it's uh, yes leveraged buyouts but you still need the money and we're talking about it's how not to, even leveraged buyouts leveraged leveraged acquisition of, leverage of, of, acquisition. As, of assets that will pay for of themselves credit in order. that's right See, we, we, what we've done with the present system is we haven't differentiated between good uses of credit and bad uses of credit. Today, the credit is supplied to government. Right now, there's something like 50, 56, over $56 trillion of unfunded liabilities for Social Security and Med Medicare, as you project. Right. So that's a hidden debt. Right. It, it, it amounts to about four hundred and thirty. So how do you solve that issue? Well, that's what I'm going to say. That's, that's this book here, okay. Capital Homestead. This is a, a blueprint. It tells you how you change the Federal Reserve laws, how you change the, the, the income tax system and the inheritance laws, and, and, and suddenly the, 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 the playing field and what for the now, future. Now, just tell me again, what exactly is Capital Homesteading? Well, Capital Homesteading enables you to get a share in the growth frontier. I have, and, and that sounds very theoretical. How, no, but, but, but okay, okay, this, okay, let me tell about, you how. Talk, talk about East... Let, 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 let's, let's talk about the big picture and then East St. Louis and, okay. and, and the auto workers. Uh, if, uh, if capital, the ring, the annual ring on the, on the growth pie, mm -hmm. okay, is about, is about two trillion a year, okay, in a total new plant and equipment, new rentable space, new infrastructure, both in the public and private right. sectors. That amounts to seven thousand dollars per man, woman, and child in America. Mm -hmm. Now, if we f said let's finance the whole thing uh, through a, what what we call a capital homestead account, so you go to your local bank and mm -hmm. you set one up for uh, every member of the family. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so now we have a, a newborn child today is able to get uh, th parents to to set up an account for them, and they get seven thousand dollars a year. Okay, in new new capital credit that will pay for that will be invested in a company for which a member of the family works, or in a public utility, or in a community investment corporation, uh, as we're doing in East St. Louis. It's called there the Metro East Citizens Land Cooperative. And this is with land that was abandoned. No, this is government land that the government will transfer to the to the Citizens Land Cooperative, so that every man, woman, and child in this area, which covers uh, 15 communities, 160,000 people, in one of the poorest uh, areas of the country, okay? And there, every man, woman, and child will have a single lifetime, non-transferable share, as long as their primary residence. Primary residence. Is in that because area. It would seem to me that there would be ways in which smart people could abuse the system. Oh, yeah, you know, you, you, I know there's, there's always... no way to stop. Uh, I know. Uh, you, 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 what you want to do, though, is is spread the, the base it, so ownership. that they will check. They right. will check because they'll have a personal interest, personal interest. That, that will be harmed by people who try to abuse the system. But again, as you, you, you say, there's no perfection and there never will be. But, um, but but actually what I'm interested in... Okay, well, let, let me tell you what the Go results ahead. would be for that child. By the time that child reached age 65, it would have, uh, this is after tax, because we have a, a changes in the tax system, mm -hmm. would have an estate of close to a half million dollars, which, which under the tax laws that we would institute, a very simple tax system, very simple, and I can go into that, uh, they would have they would have a uh, a fifty thousand dollar close to well, actually forty six thousand dollar dividend income over and above whatever they had earned during their life. That's right, and they would have during that period of time because you have it, it. It starts gradually and then it starts building up. They would have one point six million dollars of after-tax dividends that flow to them from the growth pot. Yeah, but you got to wait for that to retire. I mean, what about well, now? Yeah, but well, initially uh, you have to you have to grow the economy. So you need no, to No, but what I'm saying is is that let, let's say you can't work or this or that. Oh, well then you you need uh, you need welfare. You need okay. uh, in there we would you know just just uh, provide people vouchers 
uh, uh, for those who have under a certain income. For example, on, on the tax system, we would eliminate the payroll tax and it would allow corporations to avoid any corporate taxes so that an individual it, it would not pay. Well, if you take a family of four, we talked about a family of four. Under that, you'd have a $30,000 exemption per adult and $20,000 for, for, for uh, uh, a dependent. I mean, this, this all sounds just too good to be true. Yeah, but anything good, too good to be true is it can't be true. The, 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 the point that you're making is a good point, that what you need is, is communication of the idea, and you need new leadership to emerge, right. and new people power, and then you need demonstrations. And that, and demonstrations. That, I mean, unfortunately, we're running out of time, okay. and we should do another <laughs> show. And, um, but if, 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 for example, if you wanted this show to be seen by somebody in power, who do you think could help what you're doing the most? Who could do it? Uh, the, the two people, uh, for domestically, it would be a man named Barack Obama. So if, if Obama got behind this, because... Oh, it, yeah, it'd be no problem. It seems to me that, that, you know, things are shifting a little bit, and maybe, you know, the more things change, the more they say the same. But, you know, uh, so if, if Obama, you get anyone in the administration... N not to, anyone. No, no, no. You don't want middle people... To be the but people. you've got to get to you've got to get you got to break the barrier so that you can have a conversation to o Obama who used to teach constitutional law where I so, got so, my so, law so he's at least you know <laughs> intelligent enough to understand what oh you're talking I, about. I have no doubt that that he is and I mean I'm enough. fascinated why nobody has even well it's a communication problem. you think it's a communication oh, absolutely issue. absolutely I mean, and not only that no I, I should add another thing it's academia academia is probably the most reactionary uh, 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 part of the social fabric well I agree you know um, the old ideas the ideas of economics from the left and the right I mean, even the, in the Keynesian middle, they do not address the ownership question. So, so we have a, 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 about 30 seconds left. Is there anything that, that you can say or do to, to help your cause? Yeah, I would say that people should get to our website at www.cesj.org because they're going to see the demonstrations that we're, uh, we're now embarked on in East St. Louis well, for citizen ownership as well as energy independence. And then they should see our work with the auto workers Workers to so well, that the auto, so that the big three can become owned a hundred percent. Because I mean, the ESOPs were something that you were involved with. Yes, and yes. and so um, anyway, this has been <laughs> Molly Cheshire and Norman Carlin, and um, thank you so much. Well, I, I really enjoy. appreciate it. Thank and you, and no. you never know. This might you own. never know. That's right. <laughs> Hi, this is Molly Cheshire, and uh, this is Meetings with Remarkable People. My guest is Norman Curlin, and uh, we tried to fit it all in one show, and it looks like we kind of spilled over <laughs> into another half an hour. Um, you know, what's interesting is is that, you know, you've done a lot of work with binary economics, right. and this all sounds very exotic, except you started a program of ESOPs, which is right. Employee Stock Ownership Plans. Right. And... And, and, and what this does in binary, I mean, for, let me just quickly explain to audience what I think binary is, is by taking future earnings and borrowing, getting credit, getting now. credit now, and then paying it off with profits to be earned. And, and this sets up a very dynamic situation right. And, right. and gives employees access to commercial credit that the normal uh, billionaires would have access to. Right. That, that, right. That, uh, so what we've enabled uh, I, some of our clients, uh, when I do professional work, uh, have, uh, they bought their company out 100% without putting up a penny. And uh, there's a company out in uh, Springfield, uh, Virginia called Mid South Building Supplies, and and we bought it out. Uh, at that For all the right reasons. Oh yeah, I mean, it was it, a healthy company. It was a healthy company. And we paid we paid fair market value. As a matter of fact, we 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 paid the higher end of fair market value, and the employees we borrowed from Equitable Bank of Baltimore. And, the and, and because paid I believe the off. owner wanted to sell, he out. wanted to sell. He was a, and, he was and he, like, he was retiring, a very wealthy guy. Uh, uh, and he was happy to give it to the employees because he, he knew. He didn't give it. He got well, no, his no, no, money no, no, no. out. 
he, he was happy to keep it within the family, so to speak. He, he sold it sold to it people to, he liked. Right. You know, he sold it. To, he, he liked the management. Uh, it was a healthy company, and, and so he sold it. We did a, uh, an independent appraisal. We had a, a someone come in and, and appraise the, it's an appraised fair market value, and, and I think the price was probably at the higher end of, of a fair so market. So it was a win-win value. situation. It was, yeah, it was. He he loved it. In, in the law, it's only because of the laws. What what happened is we borrowed enough money, paid him back. He took the money, and under the laws, he could do what's called, it's called a 1042 rollover. You take the money that you get from the proceeds and you invest it in other assets. So he could buy purchase the diversified. That's with, right. Without having to pay capital without gains. Without any, well, exactly. He was able to avoid capital gains. And, and, and he just transferred. Which for all you want to be billionaires out there, that's, that's a good <laughs> thing. And it would seem yeah. that binary well, is anti-capitalistic, but it actually is, it, because it, it, it's, it's that confusion, I think, with broadening the ownership base. And as we were saying in the earlier show, taking money away from the haves yeah, and giving yeah. it to the haves. You don't have to do that. And, and as a matter of fact, even though uh, uh, Lewis Kelso used the term capitalist, I never used the term capitalist. What would you call it? I call it, I don't have anything other than calling it, it's not just a third way. So it's different. It is not the same as 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 the concentrated power in capitalism, uh -huh. nor the concentrated power in socialism. Both concentrate power. Right. So I call it the third. Uh, I used to call it the third way until Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and others started Abuse using term. that term to to describe something which they said it was democratic capitalism, which is kind of a combination of a political democracy with economic plutocracy. And as I say, it, it's an unstable and, and mix. And plutocracy meaning the people with money control the government. Yeah, yeah, which, of course. Which is, doesn't of course. sound very democratic No, but that's what happens. You can buy the politicians. You can, you, can, you can pay enough so that the politicians do your will. But I call it in uh, the just third way. I had to add a word to differentiate <laughs> so that the just the concepts of justice, which you can find in Kelso's Capitalist Manifesto, really the three principles of economic justice tell you whether something's just or unjust. What, what and, are they? Or what are they? They're, they're th very three simple, like the tribe, uh, it's like a three-legged stool. They all are essential. Uh, one is an input principle, was the principle of participation. It just means right. equal opportunity to be an owner as well as a worker. Second is, is distribution. That's how the outtake principle. And the, and the principle there is, is, is you're, you're, you, you get out the value of your input, your, right. your labor input or your capital input. You see? Right. And if capital is now increasingly the source of wealth, then more and more of your income is going and to come from capital. And capital is not just financial capital. No, no, no. We're talking about physical capital. Okay. Yeah. Physical or intangibles like patents and, and right. copyrights and that kind of thing. Convertible to cash. That's right. That's right. It's different than securities. Right. It's, 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 it's the real capital that makes the difference in the modern world compared to the pre-industrial world. And the third? And, and the third is, is the balancing principle, which Kelso called uh, the, the, the principle of, of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, the, of limitation. I don't like the word limitation, but he called it because he said that's the anti-monopoly or anti-greed principle. Because what, what that is, is, is if you have a monopoly, you're not going to have balance between production and, uh, and consumption. So that if you want to have a balanced market economy, then you must lower the barriers so that everybody can get a piece of the action, can become owners. And, and it's simple. The simple. It's simple if you have uh, laws and institutions, and particularly your central bank and your Federal Reserve and your tax system, if they, if they are a level playing field in terms of what they do, and mm -hmm. then everybody can have an equal shot at becoming a capital owner. But, it, but as far as, I understand they want to be a capital owner, but how much input are they going to have in the running of the company? Well, that's because another issue. That's, that's another, another issue. issue. So, because, yeah. you know, you're, you're so anti-monopoly and yet, um, I, 
you know, I'm also against I'm, I'm against leadership that are non accountable and non transparent in their decisions. Well, but or I, abusive I also, leadership. Well, but but also I, I see there's if, if you get somebody who's really good at leading. Oh yeah. Uh, you pay them. No, but but what I'm saying is is that sometimes democracy is mob rule. So that oh, that's people, a, yeah, that, people that's, will make short-term decisions, you know, you're that right. are expedient, you're right. but they don't have you're long-term right. you're, you're benefits. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. So what we developed, two things. One is we, we developed a concept called justice-based management, which if you take the pyramid, the traditional pyramid for the way most organizations are run, and you flip it upside down, the leader's at the bottom. And the leader, by being at the bottom, he's a teacher. He inspires others. He is trying to enrich others. And he will get rich himself, you see? Right. So it's a question of leadership philosophy where the leader begins to see that the best way to lead is to be a teacher, is to be someone who can inspire others, is to help others become more effective. And if the leader becomes that way, let me, let me tell you yeah. what happens with the inverted pyramid. Who's at the top? You know who's at the top? Who? The customers. So that if, you're, if you want to succeed in a market system, you deliver higher value to your customer. How do you deliver higher value? Higher quality, keep the costs down. And, and under justice-based management, as you move the workers out of the feudalistic wage system, to ownership system, and as you change labor unions into ownership unions, right. so that they can now represent the ownership interests of their of their members, and as a matter of fact, even change the way the revenues go into the labor unions. So they instead of the check off on labor benefits, which of course have 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 caused the outsourcing problem in industry, because. It, 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 because you get higher fixed I'm not costs. Convinced of it. If you increase your fixed cost greater than your competitors, right, you will have a problem competing. Your co your prices will be higher, and this is the reason we're lo losing out in the auto industry, because because the the you the don't think fixed, the product has anything to do with it? Oh, oh no, but the, but the fixed costs uh, is it's, it's something like sixty two dollars an hour in total. Well, but, uh, but to uh, me, if you compared to forty four, uh, uh, and these are uh, this is Toyota and I Honda. I've, and so, I've heard this argument so many times, I, but. But that would mean that sweatshops in Asia are always going to win out over American products. Uh, until, until America gets out of the wage system and into the ownership system. So you're absolutely right. But I'm just saying that they forget the auto system. Then, then we wouldn't be selling any do you American think, products. Do you think that the American workers, if they owned the big three, would not make adjustments because I can tell you I'm working with the auto workers now. We're trying to turn the UAW from a labor union into an ownership union. And, and how are you doing? Well, we're do, we're doing. We're, we'll have a uh, hearing up on Capitol Hill this Thursday. Uh, Congressman Conyers, who represents Detroit, likes our ideas, and we have uh, not just workers but people from the strategic planning group out of Chrysler. Uh, what, and what exactly is the plan? Well, the plan is to is to scale down the existing debt, and as a matter of fact, eliminate all all the equity because it's, it's as if you're going through a reorganization. The existing equity in a in a Chapter 11 reorganization often is wiped out. And, and, the, and the Obama administration is already talking to the bondholders and saying you ought to take, you ought to take uh, uh, 15 cents on the dollar, I think it is. It's and very who, But who are these poor people that are losing all this money? Who are the, who are the people? The bondholders. That, well, that bought it, like you yeah, know, AAA it, bonds look, and now look, they're when you, when you get a bond or, or equity, you took risks. And if you didn't, if, if if in exercising your rights, you didn't, you were you were you didn't find ways to make to help that company actually succeed in the in global competition. That's the problem. It's it's not just it's not just management, it and no, and no. the shareholders and the bondholders, but it's also the UAW. And see, I used well, but to me, to blame the unions, I think is let, kind of short-sighted. Because I get paid let, so much let, more for my union, and people still buy American let, films. Look, before I went to work with Kelso, you know, before I joined him, I worked for Walter Ruther, 
who was the head of the United Auto Workers. Right. Okay, and he was, he was one of the great labor statesmen. And he testified in 1967, before he died in an airplane crash, he testified that the way to make American, the automobile industry and American manufacturing successful in the global marketplace, this is in the mm -hmm. 60s now, 67, he, he, uh, he said uh, the workers had to move from the fixed labor cost in, in, into the variable, uh, that is the bottom line. And if they could be assured of ownership and uh, ownership rights and profit sharing, that's a, that's a way to, to supplement their incomes that don't go into fixed costs. See? I see what you're saying. You so see? By taking the risks. Right. Then, then you, but you ride the highs, but then you, of everyone course. wants to ride the of highs, course. but no one wants of to take course. a, take a of, hit. Of course, of course, but, but again. But see, okay, my family started all these fringe benefits with an NCR. <laughs> right. And the interesting thing was, is, is that he was in balance in that, as he said, it didn't cost, it paid because we have the sweatshops here in America and, and we have the yeah. awful working conditions and low wages. Right. And, and he was able to build a product that, uh, okay, yes, he did have a monopoly for a small, small period of time, but even now NCR is, is you know, a very successful Yeah, company. okay, but we want to talk about really how do you bring together people and get a win-win attitude from labor unions and management that they work together to make the bottom line. As, as great as possible. Because believe me, you know, I've worked non-union in the movie business yeah. and union, and you don't want to work non-union because management okay, could, I'm not, couldn't care I'm less not, about I'm not, you. I, I am not against unions. What I'm trying right. to say is the unions better wake up. They're, they're, they're killing their own, their membership used to be, you know, one time the, uh, the, the uh, labor unions had 35% of the private sector workforce. Right. They're now less than 8%. Right. So and it's shrinking more. They've they've lost so many. I now. know, and everybody complains about. Okay. It. I just am so tired of hearing everybody complaining about the unions as if that's no, the no, problem. no, 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 no. Well, they they got to wake up because just as Ruther, I think, had Ruther lived, you wouldn't have the problems you have today. I see. You see. How would he have made it different? Well, he would have he would have gone for ownership. Right. And and that would have increased. Then then the auto industry would have been emulated in, throughout the country. It's such a basic industry; right. you can't lose it. But then what I find too is is that okay, I've worked on movies where they quote unquote give you deferred pay, yeah, and it gets lost in the accounting, and somebody yeah, breaks no, it off. But that's where the union. You see, the union, if it represents the ownership interests right. of its members, it's not going to let them get away with that unless they're raking it off themselves. Well, there is okay, a but that's where. We don't want the union to be the owners. We want the workers right. to be the owners and to have the full rights and powers. The voting rights should go right down to each one of the members. That way, management will be accountable to them. The union will educate them, will, will, will provide them information. And, and let me tell you what I see in okay. the Kelsonian world. When labor unions begin to be ownership unions, they'll reach out to all shareholders who aren't adequately represented on right. corporate boards. And, and, and eventually, if the, uh, they will push capital homesteading for every citizen. And when they do that, virtually every citizen will become a member of an ownership union in order to be effectively represented. But what I want to know is, is that, and then, you know, everyone says, you know, one vote per person or whatever. No, I'm, I don't say that. One one vote, one share, one vote. This one is, share, one vote. It's but, different than in a cooperative. But don't you think that sooner or later it's going to get skewed and that some people are going to have a lot more shares than others? Yeah, what you want is not equality of results, but equality of opportunity. So some people are going to screw up, okay? Some people are going to give away, squander what they have. Right. But, but, but that's where education has to take place. We have to begin in academia to begin educating people to what is justice, what is property, what is ownership. And then you see, then you'll, you'll have a system, an economic system that will, that will support a liberal society. By that I'm talking about a free, right. just society, a, a, a society that's truly democratic. It is not democratic today, as you're pointing out, right. because you can control the vote. You can control who gets uh, who I mean, gets elected. I'm I'm in the union, you know. Okay. I'm, in, I'm in the IA, and it's no I, joke sometimes. But but let's move on. I'm more interested. How do we change academia? 
Oh, that's the hardest. The academia, to me, academia, as I as I indicated, is 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 the most uh, Neanderthal part of, of the social fabric, particularly in the social and sciences. And they would seem to be the most educated. Oh, so yes, and therefore the, the most ignorant. The most, the most difficult to, to change out of their paradise. Yeah, it, how, so how do we get them how to do change, you do that? change oh, their paradise? Oh, I'll tell you how. You, you start, you, you get a few people in, in academia who are like Robert Ashford, who mm -hmm. is, uh, and you get others like him, you know, who can teach. Uh, uh, secondly, so education is important, and in East St. Louis, we're developing uh, centers for economic and social justice there, mm -hmm. so that they can start teaching the grassroots. You see, the the, the children and so on. Then we were encouraging them to have student centers for economic and social justice. Right. I mean, uh, uh, and academics. John H. Patterson started Junior Achievement. There which you is go. Oh, I, I was once. I was once involved in that. Well, and these were kids that were sure. came from. Slider Town, as they said, it was yeah. the slums around the factory, yeah, and sure. they were breaking the windows. Oh, sure. And he was able to rechannel the energy into the community gardens. Exactly, and, and, if, and if 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 the people own, they're not going to destroy what right. they own. You know, that's even the, kids. That's exactly I mean, right. Oh, if you want, and no question. I mean, I, I mean. So I, anyway, so how do you change <laughs> academia again? Well, you 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 you. There are four For, prongs. You, you get, there okay, are four prongs. Education. You find some within mm -hmm. to begin teaching. Secondly, you find prime movers. Like if 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 Barack Obama suddenly sees that to to be a success in his presidency, he has to address the ownership issue, and he, he begins to adopt this this plan, which is a blueprint for for him and and a benign blueprint. Oh, it's is, one. He'll he'll and I don't understand. He will okay. be Lincoln. He will he will so, have so, done okay, what Lincoln uh, did. Um, let, get, we'll get through your little. Okay, uh, the third, the third. If you, and, 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 as I said, issue. you need you need new leaders who can teach. Right. You see, the third, you have numbers of people. When when we're having a demonstration at right. the so Fed you, in two days, a million man march, a million man coming okay, into so Washington. Believe me, the Federal Make, Reserve will hear, hear the message right. and and can be changed. And, and then and the fourth, can, and the fourth is show that it works. Demonstrations, right. and we already have eleven thousand companies that are ESOP companies, eleven million workers, fifteen hundred of the companies are hundred percent employee owned. Okay, are, 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 are majority owned by the right. by the workers, uh, and and then uh, then and are profitable. Oh, they're profitable in general. What they've discovered is that they're that as long as you ESOP by itself doesn't say anything, mm -hmm. so you need to combine it. With with distribution of profits, so that people can get supplements right. to their income, plus what's called participative management, what we call justice-based management, what some call open book management, and and Springfield Remanufacturing, for example, is a good example of open book management. But there, uh, a handful of people control the vote. The first thirteen people who put it together, and this happens in many ESOP oh, companies, yeah. and that's the reason why we won't take a client anymore, unless they, unless the leader agrees to justice-based management. I'm, I'm not interested. I agree. Okay, and so, and then in in East St. Louis, we got the Citizens Land Cooperative, and combined with a seventy million dollar very advanced waste to energy. Non-polluting waste. To waste energy. and it is. It is. It's called. What, what kind of waste? Like uh, uh, any like? anything that that uh, uh, with a carbon uh, and, and any organic matter through with steam reforming. You break it down into methanol. You feed methanol into fuel cells. Wow. Fuel cells through a chemical process will convert it into direct current. Not just any kind of power. It's right. premium power. P yeah. Premium power plus water, plus heat. All of which are marketable and, you know, and it's non-polluting and it's non-polluting it's non-polluting very exciting and, and and that's why I mentioned to you before about Dean Price I want you to go okay, no, and, I'll, I'll and go talk and with talk him to because him. this guy's really okay, uh, so here uh, is the really $20,000 question okay why do you think binary has been derailed because Kelso was around in the 60s right 70s mm. and I mean these aren't new looking books I mean they, <laughs> they uh, it's, it, it, well the answer really is uh, 
And, and you had Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes uh, having Kelso. You had Bill Moyers doing Kelso and, and Adler, the, where they talked about these things. What, what you have is, one, a paradigm problem. You know, your, your politicians, your, your media people are all educated in a very poor educational system, which, which is not addressing the issues of justice, not teaching people what justice is, not teaching people what ownership is. And so, so the whole thrust of, social, of, of all of your social sciences is to create jobs. Well, not is to, to, yeah. Is, 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 no, but is, not just social is sciences. Is to train you for jobs not for ownership. It's not even to saying. encourage you to ownership. And, and therefore, ignoring that, they're ignoring power. They're ignoring the concentration of power, and they don't have a positive way for pulverizing power and spreading it out but among I mean, the people. To me, what you've described seems so simple and makes so much sense. And it just seems... I mean, I run into this a lot. I mean, <laughs> I've been working on paradigm shifting... Yeah. Um, for quite some time. Yeah, you so you know then you know what and, the problem and so, is. And so and I find it in every single field. Absolutely. It's not just economics, That's it's right. not just social sciences. It's, right. it's 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 in every single field. Because we are creatures of habit and if we're comfortable within with the ideas we have, if there's some reason then not to not to throw them out and seek something new, we close ourselves off to new thought. Territorial yeah, imperative. Yeah, yeah, there's territorial a book. Territorial imperative. Oh yeah, there was a book called the Territorial imperative some years ago, Ardry, Robert Ardry, and I contacted him. I talked about the territorial imperative. He says, you know where it's where it's most what, wait, it's wait, most what exactly is the territory? Well, that, that means if you building? go if I go into your territory, you you protect your territory from the outsider. And that can be ideas <laughs> or exactly. anything. Well that's what he said. He says where he found the greatest uh, the territorial imperative most at work was in academia. But I mean, what's crazy is that uh, within different, okay, science has sort of become, the, okay, religion used to be the old religion. Well, yeah. science is the there new religion, but go. within science, they do not listen to each other. They don't, they don't practice they're the science. They're still flat earth. They're, no, no, still, no. they're still in the flat earth uh, But they do paradigm. not practice the scientific me the they, method. Exactly. They do it's, not they're look not at open. the evidence. They're not open. No, but, but I don't mind people that are closed as long as, if, if you show them evidence. Yeah. The, that that you don't even have to be open. Just look at the evidence. But but also it's simple. I mean, what we're saying. If I go into when I went into Harlem many years ago with these ideas, uh, and and people understood. Uh, Ennis Francis, who was a community organizer, wow. When she heard this, she said, "Norm, you're opening up a whole new world." This is a woman who was really one of the great grassroots leaders. She, she died. She was very much involved with us in, in, up until 1980, and she passed away. But I'll tell you, if she had been still living, we would have pulled something off in, in, but in Harlem. It, you know, instead of worrying about we didn't make it in the past, I mean, I'm looking for ways to implement right. these ideas right go. now. Okay. So, so you know, uh, if we could get someone within the administration... Oh, no, 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 not, we got to get right... To the top. But how do you get to, to the Pharaoh? How, how we do have you, to get to the Pharaoh. How do we get to Barack? Um, how do know, we get to Barack? But you've got to get. You've got to have a way in. You've got to have but, but, some kind of angle. But but the challenge is in everybody in the media to begin to be, become aware that there's something out there that can solve the problems of war, that can solve the problems of uh, of terrorism, that can uh, uh, of, of of insanity where we're, 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 we have so many people in jail, uh, greater than any uh, any country in the world. Our well, percentage of people and, in jail. So and, we and, have, and also, I mean, the the problem is a lot of people make a lot of money off of jails. From yeah, that's state. right. As a matter of fact, we. This is interesting. You know, I don't know whether we have enough time. I don't. Well, think... we got a minute and a half. Okay. Well, <laughs> we could we could do another phone uh, <laughs> talk conversation because you know I'll be back down in D.C. Yeah, okay. sooner or later. Yeah. But um... well, remind me to talk about the new birth uh, prison, which we were trying to do in the District of Columbia. One point uh -huh. six billion dollar project. I know. It's. I, I mean, if uh... you go to our website, let let me okay. mention that. If you go to our website, you'll get all these things about the auto worker proposal, the, uh, the energy proposal, the East St. Louis proposal, and also the New Birth Project, if you go into the, it's www.cesj.org. And then you can go to the related organizations, the American Revolutionary Party, for example, Equitech, 
Equity Expansion International, the uh, Auto Workers Group, uh, the group in, in East St. Louis, the uh, Metro East Citizen Land Cooperative. So all the materials I mean, are there. And what's fabulous is, is that you know these are extremely practical projects. Yeah that can be implemented right now. This exactly. isn't like something you have to wait. You, you know, exactly. I, what drives me crazy is everyone says, oh, well, the education system has to change. No, no, You know, no, everybody no, has no, to die no, before no, we can no, start no, over no, again. No, no. And it's like, well, that's sort of like 20 or 30 yeah, years down the crazy. line. You know? That's crazy. That's and, crazy. And, 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 you know, there's an old saying in Spanish that uh, you can't teach an old parrot, you know, new words, <laughs> basically. And so my father, you know, he is 83, and yet... Even he is seeing new ways of seeing well, things. Well, you know, I'm 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 hitting my 80th uh, birthday. Well, I'm just uh, saying that, but if you know how, week. no, no, no. But if, <laughs> if you knew how, 80th uh, uh, year. Well, anyway, but Dad was very fixed on certain things, and Paula will throw in these hand grenades, and and then you just sort of sit back and see what he says. But since he's a scientist, he was a chemical engineer for DuPont. Oh, and, great. Oh. Uh, in, in, in involved in the new products. The guy next door is, was a chemical engineer well, I, I'm not DuPont. too happy about DuPont, but that's another story. Yeah. But anyways, oh, but okay. what's interesting, if even he can, you know, see things in radically new ways, oh, yeah. I know that it's possible oh, for anyone look, to. Oh, look, look. Anybody, uh, you know, who trusts their own mind, that's what it comes down to. If you present... I don't trust my mind. Well, you must. <laughs> you, you know, no, no. The mind I mean, is a terrible it's a matter thing to of trust. Self yeah, but it's, it's a matter of self-respect. I understand. You but know, the, you're the not rational gonna... mind is not very trustworthy. What? Anyway, we're going to have to wrap this up because that's another show, too. Uh, this has been Molly Cheshire, Meetings with Remarkable People. This is Norman Curlin, Binary <laughs> Economics, and stay tuned.